Violet. Violet. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to I Focus Online, Lecture 290 and 31st on UVA module. Today we have a special session that is OSCE in UVA. And to host Dr. Minija CK from Shankara Eye Hospital, Bangalore, and Dr. Veda Nayaki Rajesh from Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai. May I now request Dr. Rolika to please uh, introduce our speakers for today? Sure. Dr. Shifari, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Minija Ma'am has graduated from uh, uh, Government Medical College, Bellary, and she has finished a DOMS in DNB and also a Medical Retina and UVA Fellowship from Shankara Eye Hospital, Coimbatore. Currently, she is the head of the department and, and uh, of the Medical Retina and UVA department. And she's also a member secretary of the Ethics and Scientific Committee in Bangalore. She's published several articles and is involved in several clinical trials, even as principal investigator. And uh, our next speaker would be Dr. Vedana Aiki Rajesh, ma'am. She, uh, she graduated in medicine from Coimbatore. And she finished her DO and fellowship at Arvind Eye Hospital. And she is a part of the Arvind Eye Care System and currently a consultant at the Department of UBI. It is there. She has been a co-investigator in international and multi-center trials. And she as well has published several peer review journals and um, articles and has co-authored few book chapters. So over to both of you for a wonderful session and an interesting session for all the postgraduates. And I welcome the hot seat participants who have today joined us for the interesting session and they're all keen on answering. And I'll keep putting up their names on the chat box so that uh, uh, the two speakers have an idea about who all are joining. So over to you, ma'am. Yeah, good evening and good evening. And I thank the iFocus team for giving me this chance and I'll start straight away. I will start with a very simple asking question. So we all know uveitis is a disease where uh, a patient to be treated should have a systemic evaluation and a systemic diagnosis. So the first asking question will start with the systemic uh, evaluation. So this is a 14 year old sorry. A female who presented to us with right eye redness on and off. On evaluation, the child had a flicton alert conjunctivitis. So I think everybody are very clear with the flicton diagnosis. But as a routine, then we did a systemic evaluation. So the MANTU was done as a first line investigation. So we got this after 48 hours. Now the question is, how is MANTU injection given? What type of reaction is this? How will you interpret MANTU reading? And can you name few conditions where it can be false positive? So can one of you start answering this? I think it's a very simple uh, question to begin with. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Aditya. I think so MANTU is it. usually given subdominally about 5 to 10 tuberculin units. This is a necrotic MANTU reaction which was displayed. And... Uh, Interpretation, basically we have to measure the induration. So if the forearm is there, then we have to uh, take a pen and uh, go from the periphery to the center of the lesion and uh, from four sides and the, whatever area we get, where we have the induration, we have to measure the diameter of that area in millimeters. And then few conditions where it can be false positive is one is if BCG vaccination has been done. And... Uh, um, Okay, no problem, no problem. Okay, we'll just see it a little elaborate. So he has given answer for everything. As we all know, he's a fellow, so he has given everything correct. So we actually give 0.1 ml of 5 TU tuberculin PPD RT23. So for a, a PG, they, I think they should know everything in detail. So PPD RT23 is the strain being used and we have to give it intradermally. So uh, like what type of reaction I meant was what type of hypersensitivity oh, reaction yes. it was. So it's a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Maybe I should have framed it a little different. So here the T cells get sensitized by the prior infection. So they are recruited to the skin side when we give an injection and they release lymphokines. So we get erythema and induration. So when we read, we usually look at only the induration and not the erythema. So we have to read it after 48 to 72 hours. And uh, it's usually given on the left arm 
forum all our aspects so we all know that uh, it, like as a uh, rule it's always given in the left arm unless there is an uh, issue with the left arm we go to the right arm so we always look for a man to scar in the left arm so even in a patient who was given years back if there is a scar at that point we know that the patient had a man to necrotic man to in the past so um manager ma'am i think the, the transfers so though we are making four markings we always take that uh, transverse uh, uh, measurement along the long axis of forearm so main thing is 48 to 72 hours don't get carried away with the erythema maybe in our population erythema may not be a big issue because we are sort of dark skin so it's okay but still don't get carried away with erythema and usually the induration has to be measured along the transverse route so false positive can be seen in non tuberculous mycobacteria previous bcg vaccination and when there is a wrong, wrong administration if it was not given intradermally so false negatives can be seen when the patient's immunity is compromised so one more point so we we'll say more than 15 is significant but in these patients even less than 15 has to be considered significant so now we will go to the second question and aditya it was a very good uh, response good thank you ma'am ma'am yeah uh, thank you again i focus dr santosh anavar and the whole team of i focus for giving me an opportunity to be a part of it so we have selected i think i know you had the uvr modi module which is you know covered all the aspects so we have we have trying to cover the similar kind of questions based on that so my second question you i know imaging in uveitis is very important so this is one of the important imaging which you know many of us really don't do it or don't follow it so i would like you to to see the image and see what kind of imaging it is and what are the indications when we use this kind of imaging what is the principle behind it and how does it help you so you can just take one minute and i think anybody else can answer because aditya has already answered okay. so i would who would like I'll to i'll answer ma'am yeah sure sure what's your name i didn't get your name uh, ma'am shweta yeah sure sure shweta Uh, so ma'am, this imaging, uh, ma'am, this is five picture fundus auto fluorescence, and uh, uh, two indications that uh, uh, that it it can be used for is uh, ARMD geographical atrophy and uh, uh, to see for uh, um, astrocytic hematomas or any drusens. And principle is ma'am, uh, the auto fluorescence in the lipo uh, lipo fusion in the pigments, and uh, it helps in pro prognostication as uh, we can see for the atrophy. Uh, for the rp that is uh, uh, intact or if it, if it is live or if it is dead so what is the significant in this image what we are seeing what do you think it's important in this whatever image you are seeing what is the significance because you told me rmd hematoma astrocytic indications but here what the picture is showing is what peri uh, lesions in the periphery uh, i'm not sure of the particular disease then i think i know you know the answer <laughs> So I'm just going to go ahead with anybody else who wants to answer. Okay. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, where the Nike. I'll just so as already Shweta said, it is a fundus auto fluorescence. Of course, now since we're talking about uveitis, yes, it's very important in uveitis. So mainly we're looking at the whatever I showed in the picture was a choroiditis lesion. So you want to know the you know the follow up of this patient, whether the healing response to the treatment. and of course as they told hereditary dystrophies and dry amd the important is fluorofluorosis it's actually like a fundus fluorosis in angiography where you know you do the important is a fluorofluorosis where there it is stimulated by a dye here you, you don't need a dye so it is more of a non invasive you know technique of imaging so fluorofluorosis as such as i said like ofusin and melanin has a capacity to absorb the light of lower wavelength and emit higher wavelength lights in the absence of external dye injection so the importance is in uveitis is i think we are since we're talking about the uvia module so i'll concentrate more on that so you have something called as increased hyperfluorescence is a hyperfluorescence or a decreased call as hypo so whenever can you just go back to the previous slide okay so whenever you look at a choroiditis lesions whenever it is an active lesion you will find a diffuse hypofluorescence so that you know the whole lesion is very active so as you treat once you treat the patient you find that when you follow it up and take a fundus autofluorescence you find a hyperim of hypoautofluorescence you know and then a hyper in the center so that shows that it is healing so later on you have a hyper so the healing pattern changes you know from that you can make out whether your patient is responding so that's what i said 
in this condition and is imaging whatever it indicates pro because we cannot we cannot always use a dye you know to even the oct may not really show us whether it is active or inactive and we cannot always you know invasive imaging we cannot do it so this is very significant in uveitis to know choroiditis healing pattern okay. okay so i'll go on to question 3 so this is a clinical question and again it's uh, i feel it's sort of a straightforward question so 45 year old female had unilateral pain redness uh, which is of acute onset on evaluation the acute picture of the patient was this and once we treated she had this picture so if one of you can start answering so what is the clinical diagnosis how will you treat this ocular condition mm -hmm. name the systemic drugs of choice and other ocular signs to look for when you have this diagnosis uh i would like to take this question yeah and who is this sorry uh, krisha ma'am dr yeah, krisha yes. ma'am yes yes please uh so ma'am can we go back to the previous back to slide? It. so maybe yes, you can describe the clinical picture Yes, ma'am. Uh, if uh, she is having acute onset and it is having unilateral pain redness, we can say that it is uh, seeing from this picture. It is uh, acute anterior uveitis. Uh, we can see keratic precipitates which are seen, and uh, uh, from the slit in image one. And after treatment, in which we are seeing on uh, the second one, it looks like a chronic uh, pigmentation after healing. So, ma'am, the pattern looks a little bit to be of a stellate type. and we can say ma'am it is uh, it could be ma'am fuchs uh, from the presentation of the kps so ma'am the clinical diagnosis i put that ma'am for the second uh, question ma'am next so slide so it was like how will you treat the ocular condition uh, uh, like we, so, we are not still okay with the diagnosis but we will see yes, we'll see okay how will you treat the ocular condition uh so ma'am uh, uh, we can give uh, symptomatic as well as uh, systemic uh, uh, drugs to the patient for symptomatic relief ma'am uh, we can uh, uh, start with a cycloplegic and uh, we can give a uh, 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 topical steroid ma'am and uh, uh, for systemic uh, drugs we can start with a systemic tablet uh, prednisolone according to the weight of the patient and uh, we can assess uh, for other conditions and other investigations in this patient itself for the uh, aso crp esr levels as well as the chest x ray and uh, uh, the uh, sacroiliac joint ma'am to look for other systemic signs uh, to confirm diagnosis okay okay so anybody wants to attempt uh, any other diagnosis or anybody has second guessing so maybe i'll start again like if you see uh, it's a granular matter kp and as yeah. the picture shows it's not very diffuse it's more in the center and while healing it's more of a pigmented granular matter kp and if you you can see there are a lot of iris atrophic patches so fuchs is more of an white eye uh, uveitis and it's not an acute picture so i'll go with like no usually when you give a diagnosis in uveitis you start with an anatomical diagnosis so if you can give a proper anatomical diagnosis your differentials will be very uh, limited so you were giving a etiological diagnosis becomes very easier so i'll say this is an acute unilateral granular matter anterior uveitis with has healed with an iris atrophy so maybe again now i will give an clue so that was little lump picture and a digital photograph So this was her complete picture. So now, what is your di diagnosis, ma'am? A herpes zoster of thalamicus. Of thalamicus. Uh, so it was a case uh, of uveitis. actually herpes zoster of thalamicus. So you can see granular matter scapes, which is like which is pigmented actually, and it's a acute picture. You have lot of iris atrophy when it has healed. So it, Fuchs doesn't have. such iris atrophy you see more of an honeycomb appearance you don't see an atrophic patch like this in fuchs and you don't get an acute picture not very commonly you get an acute picture though it's a unilateral presentation though both may be because of a virus but it's more of an herpes zoster of thalamicus so how will you treat the ocular condition so we treated with topical steroids topical antiviral and oral antiviral so systemic drug of choice so it may be either acyclovir or valcyclovir so in our hospital we usually start with valcyclovir 1 g tds it may be from 6 weeks to 
six months. And other ocular sign to look for is proper fundus evaluation. So when you suspect a viral anterior uveitis, always look in the posterior segment for acute retinal necrosis. So what we were speaking about is an ocular sign, not a systemic sign. And we have one more point. If it is there, it will add to the clue. It is patient had increased IOP also. So I think that would have helped you more if I had told in beforehand that the patient had an increased IOP and we all know IOP rise is common in most of UVAT conditions, but it is very high in, high in viral UVATs because of anybody wants to attempt why uh, IOP rise is more common in viral UVATs than other uh, UVAT conditions. Because of trabeculitis. Trabeculitis, yeah. So it causes trabecular meshwork impingement because of the edema of your trabecular cells. So trabeculitis causes increase in IOP. Right? Okay. So, ma'am? Yeah. Sure. So we'll go to the next question. So I, I'm sure this must be a very easy one. 22 year old female complained with lotus. Vision was 6 6. Slit lamp was examination was normal. I mean, anterior segment in uh, left eye had AC cells. Flyer with fine KPs, anterior vitreous cells was there. And the fundus picture is shown here. So I'm sure you people can look at the fundus picture. Then I'll put the question next. Yeah. So in this, you have to describe the fundus picture and your diagnosis. So what is the drug therapy and drug choice in pregnancy? Can you just go back to the previous slide? Yes, yeah, sure. And anybody who wants to take the question? I think we all are finished now among the hot seaters. I think Aditya finished, Shweta finished. I think uh, Krisha finished. Anybody else? I mean, who else would not attempt it would like to attend the question? Shubran, Chaitra, Kirti, Vikas, anybody? Kushpu, would you like to attend? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Uh, so describe uh, the fundus picture and then give your diagnosis. Ma'am, uh, uh... This is a, in this fundus picture, uh, disc appears to be normal and uh, macula also appears to be normal. In the periphery, uh, uh, yellowish uh, uh, fluffy lesion is seen, which is uh, suggestive of uh, uh, choroidal lesion. So it is active uh, choroidal lesion, ma'am. Okay, what is your probable diagnosis? First you finish yours, then we'll go back. What do you think of your probable diagnosis is? Diagnosis, I'm not sure, ma'am. Anybody else who not attempted would like to attempt? Who's not attempted? Let us give chance to everybody. Anybody wants to attempt? Can just unmute and tell. So far, who's not attempted? So I'll describe. I'm sure uh, I will go ahead with the description. Just go picture away then. I will just yes, the picture. Yes, so always, as yes, you said, you correctly said, first you said this, but before that, which I have to mention. So the left of a patient, this appears normal, but you can see the media clarity is, this little media looks a little hazy because, you know, the images you can see and the supratemporal quadrant, you can see a white fluffy lesions, which is, you said coroditis. Now the question here is always, you know, when you see a lesion, you should always differentiate between retinitis and coroditis. So the retinitis lesions, whenever you have, you will not be able to make out the blood vessels because it'll obscure the blood vessels. And then, whereas in choroiditis, you'll be able to see the blood vessels, the choroidal lesions. So this is a very different shape because here you cannot see the lesion. So you can see a fluffy white lesion surrounded by a retinal edema. So which is characteristic and along the important clue here is next to the lesion, oh, there is a pigmented, you can pigmented lesion you can see, which is so characteristic of a Satellite, satellite lesion. Yes, yes. Which is a always we say that toxoplasma is a condition where you don't need any investigation. Just by clinical diagnosis, we can make it. So this is a case of an ocular toxoplasmosis where you can see a heat lesion next to the active lesions. So that is the diagnosis. Now coming, this we can go to the slide. Yeah, treatment option. Next, next one. Yeah. So always they'll ask you the classic therapy. Of course, the, the textbook always says the pyrimethamine followed and the sulfadiazine with folinic acid. So always you have to st start the antitoxo treatment first and only 48 hours later, we have to give steroids. That is mainly the inflammation to control because most of this, you know, you've heard about headlight in the fog appearance that is so characteristic of 
because of the vitritis, you'll see toxoplasmosis. So you need to start the prednisolone one milligram per kg daily at 48 hours after the treatment. And this treatment goes on for six weeks. And the important thing when you say is you have to stop the steroids first and then only you have to stop the antibiotics. So that is an important criteria when you treat toxoplasmosis. There are other drugs which now commonly what we use a Bactrim DS. We de always it is a, we say triple therapy because you have two antibiotics and one steroid. So it is triple therapy and it's mainly to prevent the recurrence. So we use Bactrim DS and azithromycin 500 milligrams with steroids. Now the question always as a patient with pregnancy, what do you do? So in this patients, the spiramycin has been used. So a lot of studies, analysis has been done. And this has to be mainly to prevent the mother to child transmission of this toxoplasmosis. So one more option when you think you cannot give spiramycin is only unilateral, you can always give intravitreal injection of clindamycin. So this is the main thing of toxoplasmosis. And if you ask what are the other characteristic features any other features can you tell that are of toxoplasmosis? Anybody? Other features of toxoplasmosis? Um, no, the retinocoroiditis, retinocoroiditis, next, next, anything else which you can It causes uh, papillitis also, like they're typical, mm -hmm. atypical and typical lesions. So a classic is from headlight in the fog. And mm -hmm. uh, there, then we can see uh, adjacent pigmented retinocoroidal scar with vitritis. And um, in atypical lesion, we can see papillitis, uh, neuroretinitis, frosted branch angitis, and uh, punctate outer retinal uh, the POR. PORT. Anything else? Aditya, you want to add? PIRT is also yeah. there. Yeah, then anything Punctate else? Punctate retinal. Uh, disseminated toxoplasmosis in immunocompromised. Yes. One more is a chiral is that right? Chiral is, yeah. Yes. That is a plaque around the retinal arteries which you see. And the characteristic in this is usually even in uh, toxoplasmosis you find vasculitis. But in this chiral, even if you do an FFA, the, these lesions don't leak. And they don't cause occlusions. So that is a characteristic of this arthritis. Dr. Vedanayake, you want to add something to this? Any? No, ma'am. Fine, ma'am. Like, I think everything is covered up. Yes. Because you can add some point in case I've missed out. No, because what are the important things which they have to look in for talk? So, you know, the important is uh, your clinical feature, your treatment they'll ask you. I think that's more. And the always and, the uh, in pregnancy. Yeah. When, the, when it is multifocal or when it is bilateral or the amount of vitreous inflammation is less, always think of immunocompromised state. When you think the vitreous inflammation is not significant enough for the retinochoriditis, always think of HIV also. Now, always that's what that they are always atypical. So in atypical, you'll never find this. Typical always that's a head. The vitreous is very severe. So that is the reason why we always normally they say toxoplasmosis usually doesn't need treatment as such. It's it resolves by itself, but still because the inflammation is so severe, we might have to put them on steroids. So we can go with the next. Yes. So this is a question five. A ten year old child presented to us with right eye pain and redness, and the clinical picture was this so what is the clinical picture so one of you can uh, describe what is a clinical picture what are the differential diagnosis for this clinical picture how will you manage like how will you investigate and treat this child and if you have an idea what is river water granuloma have you heard of river water granuloma so ma'am can i take this one yes yes and who is this sorry uh, krisha ma'am yeah yeah please in um, clinical pictures, we can see that uh, 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 this is uh, the right eye of the patient yes. uh, showing a normal lid like ramal apparatus yes. and the cornea seems to be clear. The anterior chamber uh, shows at 6 o'clock a white fluffy lesion about uh, 1 mm, 1 to 1 and 2 mm in diameter and uh, uh, the iris pupil seems to be dilated, probably under some mitriatic agent okay. and the you know, there is no associated uh, scleral or conjunctival lesion yes um, so, differential diagnosis for this uh, patient could be ma'am uh, one could be a uh, uh, parasitic uh, infiltration into the anterior chamber yes. uh, other could be ma'am uh, uh, seeding of uh, any kind of uh, malignant condition into yes. the anterior chamber um common commoner uh, india um, in india so in India, um, trauma, post trauma, uh, 
no in india dd for everything can be one at least so, you will be tuberculosis tuberculosis yes yes and uh, also something which is more like tb but not infective syphilis not infective oh not infective mm. sarcoidosis ah oh, sarcoidosis sarcoidosis so how will you manage like you see a lesion there you are not sure what is the etiology so how are you going to manage this child Uh, what will be the investigation ma'am, uh, yes. yes ma'am first of all we could go with a investigative approach and go for a, a anterior segment uh, imaging as well as ubm to yes. see the angle uh, area and we can go with uh, blood investigations uh, as well as montu for ruling out ocular tb and chest x ray to rule out the sarcoidosis uh uh in cases if we see uh, under cover of uh, antibiotic and steroids we could also go for uh, ac tap and uh, removal of the lesion and then for the investigation of the lesion itself yes yes uh, histopathological and uh, microorganism if present okay. um and for ma'am river water granuloma ma'am i'm not sure but ma'am um, no you can you can just attempt you can just like give a try like whatever you are uh, ma'am it is a uh, uh, um a parasitic uh, infection granuloma. which uh, occurs through <laughs> water <laughs> i'm assuming uh, yeah. but so otherwise a trematode granuloma as the name suggests trematode yes ma'am trematode yeah. trematode granuloma and as the name suggests it's common in children who take bath in pond and river okay so maybe yes, a little elaboration of you have given a proper answer for everything so a little elaboration it's an ac granuloma but as you said uh, unless the patient is from a particular geographical location parasitic granuloma may not be the first differential so tb granuloma may be the first differential then sarcoid metastasis and a parasitic granuloma management as you said it's initial systemic evaluation so before going for an intervention we start with man to we start with systemic imaging like we usually do a ct chest to look for any uh, uh evidence towards an systemic tb or sarcoidosis and finally we do a granuloma aspiration and send it for histopathological diagnosis so what is river water granuloma it's actually a granuloma which develops in children we get it in an, in our geographical locations i'm not sure it's not that common in north india but in our geographical locations we get quite a few cases it's along a coastal area it's along the tamra barni river if you have heard of that river and a lot of children they come in clusters like from a particular village so it's now if you look at the village name at the address we immediately know if you see a granuloma it will be an uh, trematode granuloma so they may be in the lid it may mimic a calaisian it may be a subconjunctival granuloma it may be a ac granuloma it's actually uh, from a trematode but the intermediate host is a snail so when the child is bit by the snail when the child is in water they can develop a granuloma later on Uh, and not every ac granuloma will be as like on the face granuloma sometimes it will be too subtle actually this boy had a very small elevation so you have to look for granuloma there and actually this boy had mesenteric lymphadenitis which was considered like a uh, normal abdominal pain and treated just with antibiotics but after that Uh, we found out that there was a um, anterior chamber granuloma there we sent it for histopathology it turned out to be afv positive then we started him on att and this is a child with parasitic granuloma ma'am you are next question ma'am yeah i think as uh, i think the previous thing the important thing always we tell about uh, you get is history taking the history yes. taking yeah the job of so the, all of you fellow you should know that you know it's so important so once you we have to always go back like a medicine you to go back once you see the thing what all it could be so as a location where they are from and what the do the kids are as you said playing uh, having bath in the pond i remember pratina madam always presenting this and you know it's, so it's so important the history taking is so important where you can come to a diagnosis and you might have don't have to do any medicine <laughs> Yeah, they even say even my friend had a redness like that. That was high. I think how Madam got that cluster. The boy who came first, he said my friend also had a similar redness after he took bath in the pond. So when Madam went there, they found actually a village full of children with the trematode granuloma. So this is my next question. Is again one of the one more imaging modality in uveitis where we do a fundus fluorescence in angiography. So I have the image of little early phase and a late phase. If somebody would like to describe. 
you know this image you can just go to the next quest next question where them yeah, so the picture i just i wanted to describe the fundus florescens angiography and what could be a diagnosis and what is the indication why you do what do you do ffa in uveitis and of course the important leakage characteristic in leakage the previous slide um, so, can i take this question Yeah, sure, Aditya. Uh, okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, so this is a I'm fundus florist. I'm sure all the answers will be right. <laughs> so this is a fundus florist in angiogram showing the left eye, and in the early phase we can see there is some disc hyperfluorescence, and there is some vessel staining and perivascular leakage along the inferotemporal arcade with uh, hypofluorescence. Uh, in the along the inferotemporal arcade, in the late phase the same area remains hypofluorescent with a rim of hyperfluorescence. With vessel staining and perivascular leakage, uh, so I feel this could be an area of retinitis, and uh, so the different the different indications for fundus florescens in angiography in uveitis include retinal vasculitis to know the extent of inflammation, to uh, then retinitis and uh, to look for complications of uveitis such as choroidal neovascular membranes. Mm. then uh, characteristics of ffa in vkh so different characteristics in different phases of vkh if we have an acute vkh we'll see a starry sky pattern where we have pinpoint leakages from the at the level of rpe we'll have a uh, uh, subretinal fluid and pooling because of uh, retinal detachment and disc hyperfluorescence because of uh, papillitis in the chronic stage we'll have a staining of the peripheral choroidal scars Oh, that's about it. All, all answered almost all of them, Aditya. We can just go to the next slides. Yeah. So the importance, uh, as you already Aditya has told, the early phase there is a hypofluorescent, hypo sorry, I think it's written the wrong, hypofluorescent patch with defined uh, in the early phase. Uh, hypofluorescent. Now the question is, why do you get hypofluorescent? The early phase is hypo. It's mainly because either it could be a choroidal capillary hypoperfusion. Look at, and it can cause a block fluorescence or edematous RP in the retina. So yes, it's a retinitis for it. It's edematous, so it blocks the fluorescence. So that's why you get in the early phase hypo. You don't have, but in the later phase, you can see the hypofluorescence. It's, what happens? It spreads centrally to form a uniform and a spotty appearance in the entire lesions. It's mainly in the choroidal vessels. As I said, it could be choroiditis or retinitis. It could be anything. Now, why do we do FFA in uveitis? Because one thing is, of course, you always want to look at an inactive and inactive lesions. Coronitis you can make out by the fluorescent pack uh, leakage pattern. Of course, existing pathologies like you know some of these patients have a cystoid macula. Of course, you have an OCT now, but still cystoid macula edema or you have a coronal neovascular membrane. Sometimes clinically, you know, you don't find those vasculitis. The capillary leakage may not be seen clinically. So these are the conditions where you know you do an FFA and you know the severity of the inflammation in the eye. Because you may not uh, occasional cells in the vitreous, but you don't know how much severe it is. But FFA might leak profusely, which shows that there is activity and we need to treat. So as I said, initiation of your treatment, whether you want to do systemic steroid or even a modulators, solid treatment will be based on the fundus fluorescence angiography, especially in vasculitis patients. And the second thing is, of course, to identify for treatment management, your especially in vasculitis patients, of course, if you have you want to know whether there's a new vascularization. And of course, if there is a neovascularization, we are not going to do a panretinal photocoagulation like how we do it in a diabetic, a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Even in a few in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, if you have an NDE, you are going to do a panretinal photocoagulation. But you know what happens with panretinal photocoagulation? There are a lot of you know your peripheral vision, your color vision, your contrast. So these are all patients who are coming with vasculitis, and they are young patients. Then you want to preserve the peripheral vision and all the contrast. So always, it's better to know the areas of your capillary non-perfusion because I'm sure most of these patients you don't find extensive. If it is extensive, yes, you have to do it. But some of the patients you find only one area of NBE, and you when you do an FA, you find so you we call it as more of targeted photocoagulation. So you can do a targeted for that. That is a very important in case of vasculitis in doing an FFA. When you see an NBE, you know we have to treat, but still to know the extent to cover the area, FFA becomes very important. And VKH already have said. You have the pooling of the thing in the subretinal space, and of course the leakage of the disc. I think that's very important to differentiate it from APMPP, which looks almost similar to clinically looks similar. Where FFA will really give us a clue the diagnosis of leakage. Whether you want to add something to it, the FFA. No, ma'am. I, I think I think everything is covered. Yeah. Only thing is like maybe to differentiate choroiditis and retinitis, you have to look at the fundus picture before you start commenting on the FFA. So you will have an idea as to what you are looking at. 
So I think it's a, we cannot say, we are only saying active from inactive. That's why I put it in. Yes. It's more of your getting to know whether, as you said, it's neither choroiditis or retinitis. More of we can say that. Is it active or because active you are, are you have such a pattern changes like fundus autofluorus. The same way your FFA, as I was telling you, FFA and fundus autofluorus is similar principle. Only thing we're using a dye, in this we're using a dye, other one we are not. So we can know active and inactive lesions, but not whether what is exact. Always correlate clinically as the radiologist says. Okay. So then I'll go with the next question. So this is a clinical question. So a 35 year old male presented with loss of vision with granulomatous anterior uveitis and he had this fundus picture. So if any of you, so can you describe the fundus picture? Again, a differential diagnosis. How will you investigate and manage this patient? And if you have diagnosed, so what is the drug regime for this particular clinical condition? I think Aditya should have taken this. He went for a easier uh, a question. Uh, so, anybody else wants to attempt? Um, if there are no takers, maybe we'll ask Aditya no. only to yeah, answer, or anybody sure. else who wants to. Anybody else there? No, I don't I want to. Them to answer. I think, uh, ma'am, given the situation that it's a 35 year old male with granulomatous anterior uveitis with this kind of fundus photo in the left eye, we can see there's some vitreous haze. Then there is some subretinal uh, yellowish uh, lesions. And uh, this seem to be choroiditis lesions uh, along the at the posterior pole as well as along the in inferotemporal arcade. So. Yes. Since this is a granulomatous uveitis we want, and uh, choroidal involvement, differentials include commonest tub would be tuberculosis uh, among the infective etiologies, tubulo, uh, then the sarcoidosis and uh, other granulomatous disorders. And uh, our, to investigate, we have to uh, do the baseline tests such as MONTU, Contiferon Gold, chest X-ray, CBC, ESR, CRP, and, do, uh, and to rule out the serology, so HIV, TPHA, to rule out syphilis in all the cases. And in, if the tubercular uh, uh, tests do come positive, then we have to start on anti-tubercular treatment, which would be for nine months. So four drug regimen for first two months, which is isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide, and thambutol for two months. Then isoniazid, rifampicin for seven months. Okay. So I think he answered all the questions. So it's a multiple choroidal lesions, TB, sarcoid, and like in rare cases, it may be even metastasis. You do systemic investigations. Nowadays, we stick to CT scan. We don't go for chest X-ray because we are seeing a lot of patients with axillary nodes, mediastinal nodes, and cervical nodes. So it will be very difficult for us to pick up all those things in a chest X-ray. So whenever we have a doubt, we straight ahead, straight ahead we go with uh, CT chest and ultrasound abdomen. So in 20% uh, of the time, it may not be a pulmonary tuberculosis. So we want to do ultrasound abdomen or a CT abdomen to look for uh, extra pulmonary tuberculosis also. So if there is a doubt, we can go ahead and do a vitreous biopsy. We can do a PCR TB and confirm our diagnosis. And not every time it has to be an active systemic tuberculosis to say it is like ocular TB is active. So even if it is an inactive TB systemically, the uh, tuberculosis, like the ocular TB has to be treated with ATT. So other differential diagnosis, as you said, it's sarcoidosis. So how will you differentiate clinically? Yeah, obviously in a CT scan, it, there may be calcifications. And if your PCR TB is positive, it's all in investigation. So clinically, uh, if you see this TB lesion, like is, this choroidal lesion is more of a grayish white lesion. So in sarcoid, you see more of an orange lesion. So the lesions are sort of orangish and they are not along the vessels. So you will see a TB lesion. Usually it is along the vessel and vascular arcade. So in sarcoid, you won't expect it to be along, a, along the vessel. And if there is a vasculitis, it is more of occlusive vasculitis in TB, while in sarcoid, it's a patchy vasculitis. You see discrete vasculitic lesions in the sarcoidosis and this granuloma is more common like like choroidal granuloma this granuloma is more common in sarcoid than in tuberculosis so the regime has he said hr is a d for two months followed by hr uh, though for systemic tb we give hre because of uh, ethambutal toxicity we go for hr for four to seven months and uh, uh, though not uh, for a pg level but i feel uh, when there is a systemic involvement the government still sticks to HRE. So if your 
systemically patient is inactive and only ocular TB is there, maybe uh, HR for seven months should work. But when the patient has systemic TB also, a uh, few of our pulmonologists are against giving only HR for seven months due to drug resistance. So that's not for the clinical response, but because here usually give HR for four to seven months. Ma'am, you want to add anything to? I think uh, Dr. Agarwal was asking about differentiation between TB and sarcoid. One more is the healing pattern, the pigmentation. The yes, sarcoid is a mark of pigmentation, whereas in tuberculosis. So some, they might ask you sometimes, you know, the TB choroiditis and sarcoid, how do you differentiate? So as she said, clinically inactive lesions, how it is along the vessels and healing pattern also might be because, because sarcoid is you don't find much of pigmentation like how you see in a tuberculosis patient. So you see a CR scar along the vessel, that's like, like again, like a toxoclinical picture. You don't even like, you know, in our setup, when it is difficult for us to investigate, we find it as a clue to start the patient on ATT trial. So this is my next question. 24 year old, I think it's quite a simple one. Presented with acute onset of redness and pain unilateral since one week. Posterior segment examination is absolutely normal. So question, next, next slide. So describe the preclinical signs this picture, your probable diagnosis, and one investigation of choice. You can go to the pic image. Here. I think uh, uh, I have to take this. Yeah, sure. Kushbu? Yeah, Kushbu, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, like, what are the questions, ma'am? Sorry, yeah, can so you go to the question? Clinical signs in the picture, preclinical signs, what you're seeing, probable diagnosis, one investigation. You can put the picture. Yes, picture uh ma'am in clinical picture there is a hypopion is present yeah then uh uh, pers uh that uh, thin uh, uh, membrane uh, is present mm -hmm. um, uh, above the anterior lens capsule ma'am mm -hmm. i'm not sure whether it's complicated cataract or not it's not clear in picture and uh, congestion is there ma'am Okay. So you describe the three clinical. Are they there? You want to, you know, modify the findings? What she said because you're a. So, uh, uh, so we have this case of 24 year uh, young male unilateral redness, acute onset with hypopion fib fibrinous anterior acute uh, uveitis, and uh, so three signs would be as she described correctly. There's a hypopion, there's circumciliary congestion, there's a fibrin membrane in the anterior chamber. Yeah, so the, I think the importance is the congestion. So, you know, all, we always say all red eyes are not uveitis. So how do you differentiate a uveitic eye from a conjunctivite? Because both looks red. And sometimes nowadays you're seeing a lot of viral conjunctivitis. And I, why I'm saying this, because a lot of viral conjunctivitis when referred to the UVI department saying that it's uveitis. So the important characteristic of Uveitis is circumcorneal congestion. Always look at the palpebral conjunctiva. If the palpebral conjunctiva has follicles and congestion is profuse, you know you're not dealing with uveitis. It is more of viral conjunctivitis. Whereas in uveitis is more of you know circumcorneal congestion. The second thing is fibrinous. There's a fibrinous membrane and there is a hypopion. Okay. So now what could be your diagnosis, Kushbu? You said the signs. Now what could be your diagnosis? Probable diagnosis. You just give the diagnosis. Now I gave you a clinical picture just based on this. Ma'am. Uh, yeah. So always whenever I think uh, Dr. Berenike told you already, you know, you should need to tell first is now I already gave you the clue saying that acute onset. So the onset, always you have a classification of uveitis based on the onset, based on the pathological anatomical location and etiology, right? So based on the onset, I told you she just give one week of redness. And so you can, uh, yeah, it's acute. It is acute, uh, yes, acute and uh, acute uh, uh, anterior, uh, uh, acute anterior uveitis, ma'am? No, but one more thing, pathological, because I, I just said there is a hypopion and ribrinus. I never spoke about KPs or anything. So important is pathological, whatever you can say, whether it is granulomatous or Non granulomatous. It is non granulomatous, ma'am. It is an acute anterior non granulomatous. Non granulomatous. Okay. What investigations? I told you the age group of the patient, the onset. So, what investigation? Because some of this, as you know, you read is most of them, you don't have to do elaborate investigation. So, what do you think? One investigation which strikes comes to your mind when you see this patient?
Yeah, other than Aditya, anybody else wants to answer the question? Aditya is like waiting to bust out. No, I know he knows the answer. That is <laughs> he's like the first mentor in the class, ma'am. Please. <laughs> Ma'am, uh, maybe it's HLA-B27. Yeah, 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 you're right. HLA-B27 is important because whenever you have a young patient, unilateral with acute onset, and you know, when they have a fibrinous, the broken sinus, you always think of uh, fibrinous sanitary bed is HLA-B27. The important is whenever you have a hypop, you know, other causes for hypopion, anybody else? Ma'am, in Bessets also, Ma we can Bessets? see hypopion. Pardon? In Bessets Bessets also, Bessets. hypopion is present, ma'am, but the uh, eye is white. No, no. Not. In that also you have a thing. And any other conditions, okay. vaccines, yes. Malignancy, ma'am? Yes, masquerades. It's very important to rule out masquerades. So what are the difference between all these three hypopions now? But clinically, when you're looking at it, how will you differentiate it? Could be HLA-B27, could be vaccines, could be masquerade. Ma'am, in... Uh, uh, who's going to answer? Kushbu or Krishna? <laughs> anybody? Um, yeah, tell me, Tisha. So, ma'am, uh, in HLA, uh, the you know, fibrin content uh, is uh, more, ma'am. So, uh, so the hypopion will be uh, relatively immobile. Correct. And in Bassett's, uh, it will be, ma'am, uh, mobile. True, correct. Then another one? Masquerades. Mm. Uh, for masquerade, ma'am, Associated, ma'am, uh, there will be other findings. Usually, what happens in masquerade, you have a white type of beyond. You white, usually, in those patients, the eye is white. You'll never find, you know, when you have so much of normally, when you have so much of hypopion, you have intense inflammation, you know, circumstantial condition. Whereas, when you have patients with leukemia, when you see the white hypopion, the eye usually seems to be quiet, but you'll just have the hypopion. So, it's very important to differentiate these conditions when you have hypopion. We'll go to the next one. Anything you wanted to add with that? Yes, ma'am. One thing, like they always correlate HLA B27 with ankylosing spondylitis. They keep forgetting psoriasis. Sometimes, like you can see the patient holding this little lamp and the psoriatic lesion will be there on the hand, but still they'll be like, Madam, I don't think there is any associated systemic history to say HLA B27. So always look the patient as a whole, like not only the eye. Look at everything. So something sometimes it will be like on your face, but still will be missing. So HLA B27 is not ankylosing spondylitis alone. So you have to know the other causes also so that you can diagnose and treat the condition. So coming to question nine, it's a 35-year-old female presented with bilateral sudden loss of vision. So though the fundus picture is a single picture, but it's a bilateral sudden loss of vision. So the patient had this clinical picture. And describe the fundus picture, differential diagnosis, and how are you going to differentiate it? And if you have a diagnosis, what are the ocular imaging to be done? And how will you manage this patient? So, anyone? Kushpu, Krisha, whoever wants to answer. Anybody else there in the list? Uh, I'll answer, ma'am. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, uh, so uh, clinically, ma'am, in the picture, ma'am, since media is clear and optic disc can optic disc uh, seems normal, and there are multiple uh, lesions, uh, multiple choroidal lesions that we see uh, all over um, in the center, in the center also, and, uh, and in the periphery also, and uh, since vessels are visible, so they uh, mostly they they are choroidal lesions, and yes. ma'am, what was the other question? Yeah, differential diagnosis. Okay, differentials, ma'am, would be VKH1 in this yes. patient's uh, uh, young female. Yes. And uh, I cannot think of differential, I don't know. Okay, okay, fine, fine. So, what will be your like investigations when you think it's investigation, VKH? First investigation would be OCT. So, we want to rule out the macular edema if it is there or not. And uh, what else can you learn from OCT? What else? Uh, Any other findings in OCT? Mm. Okay, fine. It's okay. FFA, FFA, I think we already discussed. Maybe yeah, you FFA. just say the, the uh, finding in uh, FFA for PKH. I, like when we say, uh, yes, starry sky pattern. Yeah, starry sky pattern. 
So how do you manage uh, the patients? So you manage steroids. We'll start with the systemic steroids. Okay. So what sort of steroids? What dosage? Bye. Vicelon, ma'am, ma'am, Predmisolon, Vicelon, and we'll start, ma'am, one milligram per kg. Both yes. tablet after meals. Yeah. Anything else? Is that help? Mm -hmm. We can't just jump to Azoran, no, sir. Maybe you are partial to Azoran. You can't just say Azoran type. Okay, okay. We'll see in detail. So, yeah, as she yeah. said, uh, we'll say it's an acute phase of VK. So, we can't just say VK. So, VK has a lot of phases. It's acute phase of VK and there are a lot of differentials. So again, as Madam said, you have to ask me whether there was history of trauma. So if there is a trauma or if there is a surgery, then it could have been a uh, case of sympathetic ophthalmia. So nothing is different between VKH and SO except for history of trauma or surgery. So it may be a case of sympathetic ophthalmia also. And in very rare cases, sarcoidosis, you can have bilateral serous detachments. And in cases of severe posterior scleritis, you can have similar uh, serous detachments. But again, if you have a clinical, uh, like prodromal phase, patient has tinnitus, headache, and all those things, then it may be a case of VKH. So OCT usually will show high retinal detachment, subretinal hyperreflective dots, and RPE folds in OCT. Again, we have discussed about starry sky pattern and hard disk in 94.4 percentage of the patients. So again, this is more of a Harada's form of VKH. This is not like granulomatous pan uveitis. Sometimes if it is granulomatous pan uveitis, you know for sure it's bilateral VKH. But sometimes you have to do a FFA to rule out CSR also. We have had cases where we had bilateral CSR. So we should not just get carried away. So FFA again helps us to differentiate before putting the pumping the patient with high dose of oral steroids. So initially we start the patient on uh, oral and parental corticosteroids. In some places, they start with even IV methylprednisolone for three days before switching over to oral steroids and we give local posterior subtenon injection. So you give posterior subtenon injections to keep it in un under control. Then you look at the response and look at the severity, then decide about immunosuppressives on the longer run. For a few patients, if it is very severe, maybe we have to start it within a week's time. For a few patients, it may be a single episode. They usually resolve well after parental and oral corticosteroid. Maybe after that, we can decide whether the patient needs immunosuppressive or not. It varies from hospital to hospital. Uh, but in our hospital, we tried with the steroid, the high dose steroid first. Maybe uh, within a week or uh, 15 days' time, we decide whether to start the patient on immunosuppressive or not. Ma'am. Uh, I think uh, one more important thing is when you do the OCTs, especially nowadays you have this web source OCT and the EDI. The choroidal thickness, it's very important to look at the choroidal thickness that gives us a clue whether we're dealing with the, because even posterior scleritis sometimes will have your B scan will show us a subtenon space fluid. So which goes in favor of posterior scleritis. Because uh, nowadays we are getting a lot of cases where there's a confusion about BKH, posterior scleritis, uveal effusion syndrome. Everything looks same now. So, you know. Nowadays, not much of patients get granulomatous pan uveitis. They are more of haradas than. Uh, exactly. so... So that's what I've been dealing with also. So, more of the. And as, as Dr. Vedanaiki was telling, I think immunosuppressants adding, as even as she said, we don't go in the, say, like the first itself go for immunosuppressants. It depends upon the severity of VKH. If I think if it is more of a pan uveitis kind of picture where you have granulomatous, anti uveitis, severe complicated care, and you know, these are the patients which may not really respond, you know, it takes a long-term treatment with steroids. So that's the time we might have to introduce immunosuppressant patients. Otherwise, if it's just like uh, the picture which she showed, very clear-cut media, not very resting, just a hard as I'm sure, what will steroids see? If there is a recurrence, then yes, then we might have to add immunosuppressant to these patients. Okay. Thank you. So I'll go to the next question. So this is a 57-year-old male, came with history of kidney transplant six months ago. He was on tacrolimus and mycophenolate methotil. He came with press and sudden dimness of vision in the right eye. So the questions, I know the image is already there. I just put the questions and go back to the image. So what is your diagnosis? Describe the lesion in brief. Any differential diagnosis too? Commonly drugs to drugs to treat this condition and ocular manifestation of HIV. Can you just go back Anybody else other than Aditya now, then I'll come back to Aditya because I know you know the answer. <laughs> I'll take her. Uh, yeah, okay, fine, yeah. 
Can you just show the questions? Questions first. Okay. Tell me the describe the lesion. Then you give me a diagram. Then I'll go to the. Okay. Uh, the lesion. Uh, yeah. there's a hemorrhage. Uh, like uh, in fero. Uh, supero. Uh, like uh, superiorly uh, along the disc, and uh, then uh, then there's sectoral involvement of the retina, and in which we see multiple hemorrhages and exudates, and this is sectoral involvement. So we'll give the the first diagnosis would be um, CMV retinitis, and as from the history, also the patient is already immunosuppressed uh, on kidney transplant. It has been on immunosuppressants for long, and. Uh, Two, uh, two commonly used drugs with would be foscarnet, sidofovir, valganziclovir, and uh... I, know, I think they know their book thoroughly. Then what is happening in the hospital? Yeah. The next okay, two ocular manifestation of HIV. Uh, this uh, um, Kaposi sarcoma, conjunctivally we can see lesions and uh, other. I can't recall right now. <laughs> Actually, you know, I still remember. I mean, ocular manifestation of HIV, you should start from your lids. From lids, conjunctiva, you know, you should just go by that. Lids, you have the molluscum contagious, and that's the way you should remember. Each, you know, each structure, it involves most of the structure. So, you know, you can start like, you can remember like that. I'm just telling you because you said I forgot. <laughs> okay. I'll go to the yeah. answers. So of course it is CMV retinitis. So you have that yellowish white creamy lesion that along along the supratemporal arcade, and of course the differentials could be CMV retinitis, ARN, or a PORN. Now if I ask you, how do you differentiate between CMV retinitis and PORN? In PORN, it is mostly the peripheral. Uh peripheral retina that is involved and then uh, uh, immuno immuno uh, competent patient will see P O R N. You are agreeing with what she said? ARN is mostly uh, I would like to differ. So the thing is uh, P O R N is most commonly seen in immunocompromised patients has a uh, classically central uh, posterior pole involvement first and on the OCT scan you'll see an outer retinal involvement first as compared to CMV retinitis where there'll be a full thickness necrotizing retinitis and uh, uh, PORN you'll have a paucity of vitritis so you won't see much vitritis because these patients are so immunocompromised the WBCs are low so not much with not much inflammatory signs but uh, rapidly progressing posterior pole necrotizing retinitis with the outer retinal involvement first. So what are types of uh, CMV retinitis? Ma'am, there's granular type. Then there is uh, the pizza pie appearance, which is the one which you've shown, the hemorrhagic. Uh, and, and then... That is the, that is the classic one which we say. Pulmonant. one. Other one is the is the granular. This is the commonest type which we always see in case of CMV retinitis. In Gordia. So the commonly drugs normally we use is... Uh, I think you told about foscarnet and I don't think... So. With an IQ, do you use them? I don't use no, them. No, <laughs> no. The commonest drug which we always use in CMV retinitis is valgancyclovir or a gancyclovir. This is the two drugs which we use. The dosage is 900 milligram BD. If it is gancyclovir, 1 gram TID. And of course, nowadays, sometimes we do give intravitreal injection of gancyclovir that is based on the, you know, if it is a phobia threatening, very severe, and patient has, uh, you know, sometimes this, uh, their liver toxicity, you know, their hepatic, you have to always get your liver function test and a renal function test before we page start the patient on antivirals. So it's very important to check those. And if you have anything, then we might we can give even intravitreal gancyclovir. Cochlear manifestation, of course, Kaposi sarcoma, the herpes, when that is one more, you might see herpes, molluscum contagious. So these are the conditions which you get in case of HIV. Are we continuing, ma'am? It's nine. So I'm not sure really what is um, Rulika, you are here, you are there. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, if you have more questions, I think it's very interesting if you want to continue. <laughs> we have questions for one more hour. <laughs> we actually, like, we are, we were not sure, like, what will be the oh, pace yeah. of the... Uh, we are in which yeah. number? No, we are in now. We are now uh, in the ninth question. Ma tenth question, ma'am, I think. Tenth question. We have completed ten. Yeah. yeah. 16 questions, right? We had put 16, I think. 16, right? yes, ma'am. Yeah, so six more, six more questions we have. So are the participants, because I know they would have been had a, I mean, they would have been working and then coming and sitting here. So I don't want them to go to sleep. 
and i think i'm none of them are sleeping i think everybody's enjoying it ma'am it's your call i think 9 o'clock uh, you can just take maybe few more questions that would be great maybe we'll have three more ma'am three more we'll go to the next so this is question number 11 a 50 year old female presented towards with defective vision of longer duration it's like it's there for years and now she has come for evaluation so she knows she had defective vision but she did not get uh, evaluated anywhere so and this is her uh, fundus picture so question sir describe the fundus picture what is your differential diagnosis and how to differentiate systemic signs you will expect at this space and uh, what is the treatment options anybody wants to take a call aditya will see if anybody else is there let them answer otherwise i'll give it to you only okay. anybody wants to maybe one or two questions even one or two questions i think it's sort of straight for forward nothing to at least they can give a differential our thanks Okay, then I think I have to give it to Aditya only. Aditya, ma'am, this fifty-year-old female seems to have a uh, uh, sunset glow fundus because there's a diffuse choroidal depigmentation. Along with that, there's peripapillary choroidal atrophy, and in the inferior uh, periphery, we can see there's areas of choroidal atrophy. So the, this is is a sign of uh, chronicity, and this we can see in sarcoidosis, VK, chronic VKH, um, yeah, and some sympathetic ophthalmia. Yeah. and uh, ma'am the next question uh, so th this is a sunset glow fundus with sarcoid vk chronic vkh or sympathetic ophthalmia how to differentiate is uh, um, the vkh will present with the other non ocular signs extraocular signs at this stage if it's a vkh they will have polyosis and vitiligo uh, so it's uh, now at the chronic phase patient has recurrence of inflammation Mm -hmm. so she has come to you but at this point only steroids may not help so yes, we have to think about starting her on immunosuppressive because it's a chronic disease at this point so it's a chronic vkh so on sarcoid so if they give you a picture without a clinical uh, background then it's little difficult to differentiate vkh from so or sarcoid at the chronic phase so again what the pg sometimes misses they search for vitiligo and polyosis even in a acute phase they have to know that deep pigmentation only occurs at a later date not at the acute stage and the treatment i think we have to go for immunosuppressives uh, and recurrence usually will be more of an anterior uveitis and vitreitis they won't have serious detachment when there is a recurrence it's more of anterior uveitis and vitreitis and always look for cma because there may be pigmentary disturbances at the macula fovea so it will be difficult to pick up a uh, cystic macular edema or even a early cnvm in chronic like inflammatory cnvm so whenever you have a doubt and when your vision is not correlating with the clinical picture do a oct to look for cme or cnvm and you start them on immunosuppressive agents and if patient is affordable and if needed on you know, the long run you can even go for biological response modifiers like newer biologicals i think usually when you are a pg they always ask you a question indication for immunosuppressive agents which i remember everybody say bezits first one more is sympathetic ophthalmia because yeah. what happens the other eye is already lost so they had just have one eye so you can't afford to you know or have yeah. this chronic involvement and lose vision so that's one more where you have to start immunosuppressives early compared to other conditions so i'll go on to the next question ma So this is the question number twelve, and it's a called. Or you know, there is a complicated cataract, uveitic cataract. So I want you to tell me what is the indication for surgery in uveitis. When all do you surgery in uveitis, and what are the preoperative evaluation when you have patients with uveitis which they have to undergo surgery? So when all, what are the lot of surgeries you do in uveitis, right? So what are the indication for now? This is one picture which has a complicated cataract. So when all we do surgery in uveitis. Who wants to take up the question? Mm. I'll take, ma'am. I'll answer, ma'am. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I'm in this case, ma'am. Uh, multiple surgeries can be done. So, if uh, if we are planning for cataract surgery, so indication would be cataract PSC is the usual indication, and uh, total white cataract, complicated cataract uh, becomes another indication, and. Uh, Uh, if uh, if there's secondary glaucoma, then we might need to do trab or any other surgery, uh, tube surgery. And uh, if uh, we have uh, 
uh, posterior uh, if we have vitreous also posterior segment like we have panophthalmitis and uh, there's sequelae and uh, if we get uh, uh, fvps multiple fvps trd rd or combined surgery so we might plan for uh, posterior uh, rd surgery in that and my pre op evaluation we want uh, uh, quite i at least 6 weeks prior prior to the surgery so uh, okay. that is like off uh, off steroids mm-hmm. quite off steroids and uh, cause if we can rule out uh, pre operatively what would be the cause if it is infectious or if it is non infectious or uh, if it is uh, any rheumatological cause anybody else wants to add anything ma'am uh, i want to add matlab i have some doubt on what she told she told that uh, uh, like only 6 week uh, we have we want the quiet eye but uh, the quiet eye uh, like it should be minimum for 3 months there should not be any inflammation to do uh, surgery yeah mostly this 3 months yeah okay. ma'am one more point i'd like to add at this stage so if a patient has a history of viral uveitis and we want to and the eye has been quiet for 3 months and we want to go for surgery we should do it preferably under antiviral cover yeah that is the prophylactic treatment correct so that is see always any any surgery in the uveitic patients the dictum is inflammation has to be under control and second thing etiology if it is a viral etiology yes any of the surgeries you have to put them on prophylactic antivirals before we start the surgery if it is a corneal involvement because they're doing a pk or your cataract we have to always start on antivirals so the indication for surgery is always whenever you ask in your pg questions is first is visual rehabilitation you might do for a visual rehabilitation or because of a complication of uveitis with some of the which you already mentioned so visual rehabilitation one is cataract and one of the in children you would have seen ban keratopathy especially in a patient of a gi associated uveitis you will have a bsk with cataract so you cannot do everything together so you might have to do a chelation of the ban bsk and then do the surgery and vitreous membranes or er it's a complications are like as you already mentioned glaucoma retinal detachment of an er the preoperative evaluation i was asking was very important is to look for cme because there is a cme you might have to give the patient if there is a non infectious etiology you might have to give the intravitreal steroids like an ozodex implant because some of the patient with severe cme we might be give ozodex or look for a cnvm some of them will have a cnvm and you know you might have to treat them with intravitreal antivirals or erm peeling so an important is a b b scan in this patient which i showed i think that was one which i wanted that two things which i wanted from you was b scan and uvm very important because if you this uveitic cataracts are always very dangerous you know for patient with bogotysis so in case you think ubm is showing a cyclitic cyclitic membrane because you don't have a posterior segment you don't know how much is involvement what is happening in the posterior segment you there may not be an rd but if you have a cyclitic membrane your treatment is just not going to be cataract removal you might have to remove the cyclitic membrane you might have to do a what approach what do you want to do if you have a cyclitic membrane anybody wants to take up the question because if you have you have to go for a pass plan i would prefer go you know which is the, you need you need an involvement of the vr surgeon here because you have to remove those membrane sometimes or sometimes you have seen do the surgery and uh, suddenly there is a ciliary shut down because of the contraction of the membrane shut down and i go for thysis so b scan thickening coronal effusion you know this patients are for poor prognostic sign the visual recovery may not be so good and always in a uveitic cataract we have to do a uvm to for the cyclitic membrane so that gives us a clue what should we do you know how to approach these patients yeah, and <laughs> to add on i think the first person who answered i i am not sure i heard it like she said off steroid for 3 months and inflammation control so if the patient is on steroid or immunosuppressive we usually actually do it under steroid cover so mm-hmm. please take it uh, it's not like you still have to stop steroid or immunosuppressive if the patient should be and usually we add up also oral steroids before like pre operatively and also post operatively so that the inflammation will be well under control i am not sure whether i heard it that way no, but i think uh, ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am i actually said it because that is what we have been taught taught that uh, uh, there there should not be any activity uh, without the treatment without a treatment and we do prophylactically add steroids though so that it does not flare up post operatively but actually, see actually the text but, says 3 months okay but as you, as i said sometimes we don't follow the textbook clinically 
sometimes there are patients we might you know depending upon the severity we might have to our it varies from case to case some patients if it is there is a posterior segment involvement we might have to start an oral steroid before we take up the patient for surgery because you anticipate more or if it is a real complete if it is a uv fuchs uveitic cataracts you don't need to add anything because you know the inflammation is not going to be so severe so some patients where you have more of iris manipulation you know it is festooned pupil you are going to you know do too much of manipulation mm -hmm. iris so you know this patients might your post operative inflammation with more so you might have to put them on topical steroids before you start some patients oral steroids so it differs from case to case because you can when you ask the question you can say based on the situation of the patient it's just not that you know every patient we get 3 months quite high sometimes okay okay so then i'll go to the next question ma so it's a straight forward question young male presented towards with drop in vision after an episode of redness so it's a oct picture i think this everybody can answer a diagnosis associated ocular like where do you get it how will you treat it topically how will you treat it locally like by local i ask like periocular and intravitreal injections so pushpu you want to like you just can give a diagnosis yes, it's a case of Uh, ma'am uh, cyst wide macular edema is present okay so it's a case of cystic open... macular edema so where do you get it like in which conditions you will expect uh, ma'am uh, though we are studying uh, like uh, uveitis we uh, we get in diabetic most commonly we see in yeah, that is patient. diabetic macular edema like you get cystic macular edema no, more commonly uh, vasculitis patient ma'am yes vasculitis is one condition we catch also now okay ma'am in bkh uh, more, more of neuro, uh, neurosensory detachment will be there yeah, that will be in, in acute picture okay post operatively you see a lot of cases where the patient develops post operative cme and in intermediate uveitis and uh, yes so in chronic anterior uveitis post op uveitis and in intermediate uveitis you can get cystoid macular edema so commonly we give tiflopredinate with topical nsaids so what we think is prednisolone acetate doesn't penetrate much till the posterior segment tiflopredinate is one of the drugs which has uh, penetration towards the posterior segment so we try tiflopredinate with topical nsaids and local treatment you can give posterior saptinone injections or you can try intravitreal steroid injections and recently like the recent advances in refractory macular edema you can even try intravitreal neuro biologicals they have there are few case reports where intravitreal uh, interleukin 6 antagonists were given to treat refractory macular edema ma'am yeah i think uh, as uh, uh, the images when you see just look at because somebody was having diabetic macular look at the other features your vitreo retinal interface because that will give you a clue if you have vitreous cells or not So that also will go you know whether you're dealing with an inflammatory macular edema or a post-operative post-operative macular edema you won't have those you know vitreous cells and so I'll go to the next question. Uh, okay, fourteenth question. So look at the image. The next one, please. The next questions. So describe the findings. Name the condition. Two conditions causing like periphlebitis or periarthritis. what are the complications if left untreated and how do you manage go to the picture raveda yeah yeah anybody wants to take the questions i think all are tired i think so i think so we might stop it right <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Maybe with fourteenth we'll finish it off. Ma'am, we will. Ma'am, I take the question. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, uh, uh, this is a right eye uh, fundus picture in which uh, we can see that in in ferrotemporal quadrant, uh, there are, uh, 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 ma'am, uh, fibrosis of uh, vessels are present, and along with uh, those uh, cotton spot are there and. Uh, subretinal hemorrhages are there ma'am and uh, in uh, around the macula a few hard exudates are also present mm -hmm. so what's the mm -hmm. probable diagnosis what could be ma'am uh, 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 
ஒரிஜினா <laughs> that's right. why i was thinking of brands retinal vein occlusion otherwise it could be a sarcoid uh, retinal uh, periphlebitis okay. is what i was thinking i think this with a question sir okay now conditions causing periphlebitis and periarthritis we'll go to the answers with the night i'll just yes. yeah so this is the relo as i said is intro temporal it's more we you should not say that fibrosis you word use the word i think it's very important when you describe a lesion what words we use okay so we have to say a very perivascular cuffing or you know sheathing of the vessels so that is a way to you know describe this vasculitis with superficial hemorrhages because subretinal when you say you should see what's the color of the lesion which layer on so it's a suggestion of periphlebitis so causes for periphlebitis is eels and sarcoidosis and arthritis is all the autoimmune like your vaginal sclerosis so the, i think one more thing what uh, aditya was telling was sarcoidosis in sarcoidosis you usually find the skip lesions you know so mm-hmm. that is a characteristic of sarcoidosis you know when you have severe this thing more of autoimmune kind of diseases complications is neovascularization which can lead to vitreous hemorrhage or sometimes fibrosis traction rd and how do you manage always steroids which needs oral all these patients will need it and of course based on the investigation we decide whether this patient needs immunosuppressive with the first go of weight and if there is any panretinal i mean sorry a sec targeted photocoagulation and based on the other complication like retinal detachment so i think i will stop from here because i think it's quite it's almost 920 now yes ma'am yes i think they are also sort of tired Yeah, I, think, I mean, it was nice all of them participated. Yeah, as the, she was telling in the beginning, yeah, whether your answer is right or wrong, it's important. Is when you speak up, you know, because that confidence goes up. Because most of them will don't answer; they're scared to answer, thinking that it may be right or wrong. I think that's okay because you all are learning, and all of us can make mistakes. So you should never feel you just you can tell whatever you know you feel that the answer is, and then that's where the confidence level goes up, especially in viva and ask because. it matters a lot in ask me right because what you answer the marks is based on that yeah. i think aditya helped a lot to uh, <laughs> finishing few of our slides also thank you uh, so much it was a very interactive session yeah ma'am it was like really interesting to see all of you participate and thank you so much i'll call you oski masters minija ma'am and vidya ma'am for uh, this very very interesting oski session and uh, especially to the hot seaters i think without your participation this evening would not have been this interesting and uh, basically uh, helpful for everyone actually the discussion and the answers that you gave and i think ma'am mostly all of them were almost correct in answering all the questions uh, so that was also very great to see everybody participating so nicely and enthusiastically and uh, jb sir is here jb sir is online jb sir also joined and i think he was listening to all the questions i'm not sure if he stuck around till the end but yeah he was there for all the most of the questions i think and he was listening to all the questions so thank you sir for joining us um and thank you so much minija ma'am and vedha ma'am again for this wonderful wonderful session and all the hot seaters uh next actually we'll meet uh next two interesting sessions are there uh, which is on march 29th which is long and short cases in uveitis by dr santosh mohapatra and on march 31st we end the uvia session uh, with a bang with a uvia grand quiz and dr abhilasha and dr parthos sir will be the quiz masters for the uh, quiz so all these hot seaters and your friends please call them uh, i think it's going to be as interesting as this session and i think it will be on kahoot so you all will enjoy so please ask your friends to join uh, the quiz that is on march 31st rolika any kind words no i can already i can already see aditya and shweta cracking their like you know knuckles for the quiz coming up <laughs> they'll be like yes we will be ready and we are all prepared because of manager ma'am and vedha ma'am so we will be there for sure <laughs> so thank you so much ma'am for being there
to both of you for sparing your precious time today. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone.